Prologue. The New Wave. The cacophonous wailing echoed through the pristine white metal chamber. The sounds mixing of ear-splitting shrieks that rattled the glass and the sound of soft rumbling. The cries of pain and anarchy almost unrecognizable to that of a human being. As it roared and pierced the air with its agonizing pleas, or were they war cries? All that was certain was the sound was unbearable. It would be enough to drive a person mad. A cocoon of sorts sat within the center of the room, large, black as pitch and egg-shaped, as it clung to the floor and the ceiling. By vein-like ventricles, the thing pulsated, pumping like that of a heart every time another flow was sent through the tendrils supporting it. It looked wet, floppy, yet it held a solid shape, with the size of a boulder. The screaming continued, getting louder and louder. The glass shook violently as the voices, or rather unholy sounds, accompanied the slow and low rumbling, almost blazing sound coming from within it. It got worse with every passing second. They could tell it was close as the reverberation was spreading so far it was being heard from outside the chamber. They took a few steps back. The pulse on the monitor was rising, higher and higher. It beeped, although its noises were as audible as a breath next to the screams that were starting to hurt their heads. Ringing started to blare in their minds, now from the loud, powerful pitch. Their heads felt like they'd explode at any moment. The very air felt as though it were constricting them as the base of the facility shook. The lights flickering and the voice reaching its strongest blood-curdling point. The monitor dropped on the floor so that the man could cover his already plugged ears. The protective glass cracking in the sudden burst that gave them a jump. And then the screaming stopped. The noise disappeared entirely, leaving only a now oddly melodious silence in its stead. Along with a spider crack in the one-way glass similar to that of a bullet, the people in white coats and protective eyewear took a bout of deep breaths removing their hands from their heads, a couple feeling their own heartbeat before checking the vitals the screen had been displaying. None were new to such an experience, but it felt spine-chilling every time. Never did silence sound so sweet to any of them than it did after the final searches. They watched through the window, and the now silent air falling comfortably around them, as out from the ooze, with a fast force, popped a hand. It plunged through the cocoon, as if it had been clawing and scraping, fighting its way out in a panic. Fingers spread, and from the tips down to the elbow, covered in a thick, black, mucus-like substance. It ran down the skin further, cleanly, however, not sticking to the flesh as one would assume, and soon breaking apart thanks to the air exposure, revealing the skin to be tan and hand to look more masculine. A second later, it began to move, fingers curling and uncurling on instinct, as the cocoon was stretched from the inside. The being inside trying to get out 
And as they did, the pod started to react, creating shadows in response to the being forcing the spot where their hand had stabbed through to become gradually bigger. The flame-like shadows danced, circling around the slowly seeping through hand, forearm, shoulder. They moved around as if welcoming the body like the gentle touch of a mother. Black mixing with a particle of deep plum purple here or there that sparkled in the harsh lights of the chamber. They twirled delicately and cascaded along the skin as if having a mind of their own. The being pushed and pushed, working their way through the small opening, tearing at it with a harsh fighting feeling, breaking free little by little until their head and upper body squeezed through. At which point, their body weight did the rest of the work, leading to fall from the cocoon a tan-skinned, bare young male, covered in the black goo like liquid from the inside of the cocoon as he landed on the floor and very soon lost consciousness. Hair medium length, dirty and covering his face from the fall. With faint wave curls. Slim and with his backside facing the ceiling as the substance acted as it had when his arm came through, making a mess of the floor. Soon after, the doors to the chamber were opened so that the people could come in and with the cocoon still steaming, take the mail to get situated. There are many sides to what we see as absolutes, many sides to point their blame, many souls who wish to wash away their shame. But what we do today has an everlasting effect, whether our actions are to destroy or protect. One mistake can make all the difference. Play your cards wrong, and you'll be fighting no more. With a snap of her fingers, fate will show you the door. It doesn't matter if you're from one side or the other. One mistake is all it takes for the strings that bind you to this world to break. That is an absolute. But then what of those with ironclad will? What of those too stubborn to die? Too stubborn to conform to fate say goodbye. Charcoal black walls box them in, along with the matching dark wood floor. Elegant design. Patterns like that you'd see on old columns with that twisting, almost abstract look. By the far wall stood a man in his thirties. Caucasian, with his tomato red hair tied into a bun using a black ribbon, yellow eyes and something of a stubble beard on his chin and around his mouth. Probably due to not having shaved in a few days. He was tall with broad shoulders and adorned a white coat that fell down to his ankles. Unbuttoned and rather clean aside from the black stains on the ends of the tail. Although those couldn't be helped. Under that, a buttoned up work shirt in black and a pair of deep brown pants. His shoes were a pair of dark green and full, almost military looking boots. And if it weren't for his features of scorching hair and golden eyes, the oddest thing about him in looks. Otherwise, he appeared as if he were a doctor, even holding a clipboard with notes on each of the other people in his presence at the moment, of which there were seven in total, and seven names on his chart. He was in the middle of reading over their names, ages, and dates to make sure everyone and everything was accounted for before today's exam. Eyes scanning over the information with the other hand holding his chin. Point your finger on his lip, an old habit. 
then he heard the slightly mechanical sounds of a door sliding open. And from the corner of his eye, he could see who had come in, making him lift his head to greet his comrade. Ah, hello, Oliver. His voice was lower pitched and calm. The man walking up to him, shorter and at least 10 years younger, being in his early to mid twenties, fair in tone with deep blue hair, shaggly cut with a few curls and brown eyes. He was tall, but shorter than the doctor by a couple feet, and slim, but less intimidating in stature. Not someone you'd send out to fight when looking at his appearance, but looks could be deceiving. As his more robe-like overcoat suggested with the amethyst shade it held. Long going down to his ankles, it resembled a trench coat with the clean lines. However, it closed thanks to a buckle around the waist with a square silver clasp matching the silver buttons on the left side of the front, seemingly for show which there were two, both sporting an emblem of a certain element, a bolt of lightning, and the one beside it, some wavy lines, small but noticeable if looked at carefully. And unlike a trench coat, this variant had a hood attached to the neckline, instead of a collar one could simply move up and down. Although the reason for this design choice wasn't known exactly, but it came in handy at times. His hood was down, and his coat was closed. The only other thing visible about his appearance was his black and white sneakers. The greeting was less cold than usual coming from the doctor, but that was probably because he was only half focused on his surroundings and it was short. As he turned his head back to the information at hand, and the younger man who went by Oliver got a pit in his stomach. His skin started to tingle, and with a tiny chill he looked over to see the cause. A small group that his medical expert co-worker was in charge of. Ranging from ages 13 to 17 were the newest to the crew seven that the doctor was now reading up on, four boys and three girls. They all wore a variant of the trench coat hood. However, theirs were a pure white that stuck out among the black of the walls, lighter than their clothing underneath, with no buttons and a dark gray fuzzy rim around the hood. Some wore the coats open, showing their white and basic clothing of a shirt and shorts that held a more dull look to them and no shoes, while others had it closed, hiding the same outfit. Some had their hoods up and some down. There were some drawing with the markers and paper given to keep them busy until the test while some just sat there staring off into space without doing anything else. One was even sprawled out on the floor, staring at the ceiling. But all were quiet and minding their own business, until their turn. This was a natural sight within the chamber. Come down here and you'd see one of the three doctors on duty monitoring their group, three times a week except for in November. The way things were down here didn't bother the doctor in the slightest. However, it wasn't that way for everyone, and especially Oliver. He knew why this was how it was, and he didn't come down here often for that exact reason. It was creepy. Seeing all these newborns just sitting around, staring off into space or mindlessly scribbling what didn't even look like anything but lines. It felt off-putting, like they were, in fact, mindless. He didn't like questioning the man due to his attitude, but looking around, he 
couldn't deny this unsettling feeling in the air. Maybe it was just him, but even so. Hey, Jefferson? You sure this batch is good? He still had to ask. Very hesitant to question the doctor, Oliver held one of his arms, turning his head to face his colleague, yet not taking his eyes off the tiny crowd out of suspicion. Jefferson didn't look away from his chart. Why do you ask? Luckily, only half paying attention as he read through the third listing. His eyes still pretty much glued to the newbies. I'm getting a weird feeling from that one. He answered honestly, yet nervously. Only glancing to the red-haired doctor beside him every so often. As if any of these mere children were a threat. Or could even muster up enough strength to pay his words mind. Which one? The doctor looked up for a second from his information, now a bit curious. So the young man pointed to the group of newbies. Although the entire room gave off a creepy feeling, there was one kid in particular that caught his senses. One that didn't quite feel like the same brand of eerie. Past the others was a girl leaning up against the corner of the wall. Her body half lifelessly slumped to the side, legs resting bent with one bent on top of the other, one arm at her side while the other was over her lap, and her head against the stone-like wall, clearly the only thing keeping her up. Looking one of the youngest, at 13, her coat opened and a bit bigger on her, as if she were given the wrong size, and hood up, causing her darker shaded magenta hair to be visible only by the couple of locks on each side of her chest. Under her coat, too, was the combination of pure white t-shirt and shorts, the same as everyone else. Her complexion was a bit fair, although held some level of ethnicity, and face lo looking so dazed it was almost unbelievable. Her eyes could barely stay open, like she was teetering in and out of consciousness with every very, very slow short breath. And the look she wore wasn't as blank, instead it was more akin to a frown. She wasn't much different from any other recruit, but for some reason, she was the one that gave him an addition to the odd feeling. The pink one. And he told as much. She just sits there, staring off into space and looking weirdly miserable. This wasn't the first time he'd seen her. And every time he had, she'd be just sitting around quietly. Nobody could get her to talk or even look at them. It was like she was in her own little world, and it felt off-putting. At least the others looked at people talking to them. She didn't do anything. If it hadn't been for the fact she was breathing, they very well might have thought she were dead completely. This was nothing that needed to be said for Jefferson to understand. After all, he was her doctor. He'd been checking up on her three times a week for the last month, and the month before that almost every day, just as he had the others. He knew and understood why her behavior would have come off as strange, concerning and to the horror movie fan, perhaps even creepy. It takes time for the husks to function properly. However, there was nothing to be worried about, as he factually stated. Give her time and patience. After all, she was created only two months ago, and her transition wasn't exactly trauma-free. 
took time for any new member to get up to speed. After all, they were essentially being reanimated and molded. It wasn't an easy process on anyone, and thus, they were in need of supervision as well as maintenance, almost daily. If memory served, then Oliver was absolutely no different at his start. Perhaps that's why he found it so uncomfortable. With little more thought, Jefferson turned his attention back to the page, finishing up and then turning over to the next. The navy-haired man, still worried, looked back at the group, watching them fiddle with their hood rims, lay around and waiting, stare, breathe quietly. One drawing had now completely covered the page with a yellow spot, and yet continued to move the marker in circles. Pretty soon the paper would rip if she didn't stop. The boy lying on the floor sprawled out had his eyes closed, possibly asleep, despite having gotten up not long ago. Two, a boy and a girl, sat opposite of each other, just staring at each other expressionlessly. It felt so off. They were blank, as expected, but did they not realize it? Did any of them know where they were? What they were looking at? Their own names? Anything? He wasn't an expert, but he could sense the hollow and flat emptiness within each of them. It left a chill down his back. Zombies, he muttered in a slightly concerned breath, the only way he could think to describe their mindless behavior. After moments of uncomfortable cold silence, maybe trying to fill the conversation to distract himself, the doctor wasn't amused in the slightest, continuing with the next page as his colleague remained almost motionless himself watching the children, and just as ravenous once they get going. So I suggest you stay away from them, for safety. Jefferson spoke clearly, now slightly annoyed, with the other man. Heard in his reply. Got it. A reply that didn't sit well with Oliver at all. If he could keep away from all of the new members, he'd gladly do so. Their auras were all so empty. Finding no point in wasting more time than necessary. The doctor flipped the pages back over and turned to his colleague. Now then, was there something you needed? His voice faintly cross and matter of fact, just like usual. As if his sensitivity wasn't enough to suggest it, Oliver had no business being down in the chambers. He was from recon, not the medical field. This soon caused him to remember, looking back at the glaring red-haired man with a second of surprise before composing himself. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, he ran his fingers through his hair, glancing away to avoid the heated look of the other man, as they too made him uncomfortable. Although in a fight-or-flight sort of sense. The mistress wants to talk to you after you're done here. This information made the doctor chuckle once in something of amusement, but not out of happiness. Rather, a more cocky sense of pride. And I trust this came from Angica herself. As if knowing his fake words of doubt would rile the younger man, coming out smooth and mocking with her name. The navy-haired man nearly bit back. However, clenching his fists, he was able to keep from fighting the smarm. It wasn't worth it. Of course, he'd effortlessly call her by name. He was allowed to with his position, but it still felt disrespectful. All right, I'll see to it in a few minutes. The doctor turned his attention away and took a couple steps forward to the boy laying down crouching beside him, ready to begin his checkup. I appreciate the message. Now, I suggest you leave. Raising up his right hand, 
fingers curled slightly as the air around it began to swirl and spiral, shifting in shade like it were turning to smoke, and then seeping through a deep black swirling around with streaks of crimson in an almost whirlpool-like fashion. It steamed and danced, coating his fingers and flowing from the palm of his hand, where the red gathered the thickest. To this, Oliver dismissed. Yeah, yeah. Turning his back himself, with his hands shoved into his pockets. When the doctor started up, you didn't have to tell most people twice. Least of all him. One whiff of his strain, and he'd be begging to leave. At the end of the road, surrounded by what remains. When the light within flickers, and will is but a wish. A new call will go out, and the game will change. People fear what they do not know. They hate what they cannot control. But they are lying in the ways between. Unbeknownst to the sides, a new pathway was forged. Only now are they realizing things aren't always what they seem. And yet, their world is still painted in black and white. Still they struggle in their pointless fight. Pathetic.